have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. See, this is the, the transition from Saul to David in the next chapter. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made woman childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. And then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So what's the, the main idea of this passage? God delights in your obedience more than in your sacrifice. We see that in the first few verses, God sends Saul out on a mission. And what we're going to do, we're going to look at the situation that occurred, and then we're going to take three principles about obedience from this story in the following section. But in the introduction, we see that God chooses Saul on a mission and says, go destroy the Amalekites. He reminds him that he's the anointed king, the leader that is supposed to battle and make the, win the wars for, for Israel. And here it is, listen to the words of the Lord. This constant repetition, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God, that is what he is supposed to obey and listen. Now, as we're looking at this introduction, this is a very hard pill to swallow. Because how can we read the story? God commands, sends Saul on a mission to go and devote to destruction this whole group of people called the Amalekites. And children, and mothers, and fathers, and infants, and, and everyone else that is there. Well, we see here that there was a group that opposed them when they were going out of Egypt. That was them, the Amalekites. And the Kenites that we read later did not oppose them, but helped them get out of Egypt. Now, we read at the end of this chapter that the King Agag made many uh, women childless. We see that he wasn't necessarily a nice guy. He was, he was part of, of a nation that looked like they were constantly killing people and doing that which was evil in the sight of God and being an abomination. As we look at things from God's perspective, things become much clearer for us, don't they? Because God is a holy God, and he is a just God, and the guilty will not go unpunished. And so God is simply bringing about judgment on this group, this nation, the Amalekites, who have been sinning against him. And what is clear is that God does not want any of them or anything that they have to be alive because their sin is so great before the Lord. This is why... The same story with Jonah goes to Nineveh to his enemies. But God is, shows grace and saves him. Here, God is not showing grace. God is pronouncing judgment upon them, and they are to be devoted to destruction. But there is grace. There is grace in this group of the Kenites that are living with the Amalekites. And Saul says, how about you depart so that you are spared? Now, the job is almost finished. In verse 8, look with me. Saul defeats them, and in verse 8, he takes Agag, the king of Amalekites, alive. What did God say in verse 3? Kill everyone and everything. He takes him alive. The very first principle that we learn about obedience is that partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience, and more so, look, about, look at how they disobeyed. They disobeyed by taking that which was good and leaving that which was worthless. They liked that which was the best in verse 9, the best of the sheep and the oxen and fattened calves and lamb, they, all this rich food that they could have. They take the best, but what do they do in the next verse? All that's despised and worthless, they, they toss aside. We're going to see later on in the story how this ties with disobedience. And so God delights in your obedience more than in your serving. As we're going to look at disobedience, we're going to answer the question, how does disobedience occur? 
What are some allies of disobedience? Or what gets caught red-handed alongside disobedience? And ultimately, how does obedience rank on God's scale? So I want to look at disobedience in three parts. First, disobedience, the heart of disobedience, then the body of disobedience, and the mind of disobedience. So we'll take disobedience as a picture of a person, and we'll look at the heart of disobedience, then the, the body or the actions, and then the mind. And so how does Saul get to this place? How does Saul get to the place of disobedience? Well, we know the reality that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. It is what is internal. What is at the heart of disobedience? Is it a lack of will, if you were to look at your own life? Is it a lack of knowledge? Is it a lack of accountability and support as you are seeking to fight against sin? What is the lack, or what causes disobedience? When we're thinking about disobedience, we could probably be in three areas of it. One of them is that we simply don't know, and therefore we disobey, or we no, but we don't know how to live a certain way, and therefore we disobey. Or third, we know and we know how, but we don't want to. And it seems like this is the category that we sometimes find ourselves in. We know what God says, we know how to do it, but we simply don't want to. Why don't we want to? Who doesn't want to? It is the king that is ruling in your own heart. You do not want to submit to the Lord and obey him. At the heart of the problem is lack of rightful rulership. Instead of God ruling in the heart, self rules the heart. We know that Saul wasn't like the best fit to be a ruler of Israel. The issue is not external factors, but the internal heart. What do we read about Saul? He was impatient, envious. He sought glory for himself. And here in verse 12, I want you to see, I want you to see what, what we read about Saul. Samuel's coming to Saul, and this is what people tell Samuel. Saul came to Carmel, and behold, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. Saul thinks highly of himself. He's doing things for himself. He's supposed to make, he is offering sacrifices when he's not supposed to. He doesn't advise God for his plans. He makes decisions for himself and by himself. This is a person who has taken God off of the throne of their heart and, put in, and have put themselves on the throne of their heart. They have displaced God. See, the heart of disobedience is a person who has taken God off of the throne and putting self on the throne. And this is going to be the battle of our life, is to keep God on the throne of our hearts. Now, what happens? What happens when we displace God and put ourselves as the king of our heart? Well, then we live by our rules. Isn't that not right? We come up with our rules that we live by, and so since we are the king, we rule. And so therefore, when we do certain things in our life, they don't seem to us as much as a disobedience. Because look at even Saul's reaction. He doesn't initially even agree that he did anything wrong. Why? Because he is living by his own rules. He has made himself king. He says, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He says it two times. He doesn't notice that partial obedience is sin against God. Because in his rule book, he does great. But in God's rule book, he fails. You see, this is what happens in the garden. God's rules were displaced by man's rules. The place, the only holy place where God should have been dwelling, the heart of man, man said, I want to be like God, and they took the fruit and they ate the fruit because they wanted to be like God's. Because the serpent was giving them this advice, don't listen to God, he's holding out on you, he's not giving you the best, you can rule your own life. And so at the heart of disobedience is really putting self on the throne instead of God. The heart is your seat of your will, your emotions, your desires. And when you rule as a seat of your will, emotions, and desires, you do what you desire, what you will. And so you dictate what works for your kingdom, and then you abide by your own rules. So that's the first thing that we see, how Saul got to this place, was a displacement of God from his heart. The second thing that we see is the body. We see here, so they do what they want. Look at verse 19. Samuel has a different view about what Saul did than Saul does. We got to see sin from God's perspective. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil? You see, now when you are ruling in your own heart, the natural outcome is you do what pleases you. They pounce on the spoil, right? That's a key word. They're like, they're like hungry birds eager to fill their bellies. 
They're not seeking to kill the cattle like God commanded them, but they are desiring to keep some. They're looking at pleasure. And we see that, know that from 1 John, it's the lust of the eyes, the flesh, the pride of life. And here it's the, the, the lust of the flesh that is causing them to sin against God. Our desires are shaped by who and what rules our heart. If you are the king in your heart, then you are being ruled by your desires to please self. If God is on your heart, then you're going to rule and live a life that pleases him. Think about Solomon, for example. Solomon was someone that did not keep anything from his eyes, but did what he desired. Even, even turning to foreign women who turned away his heart from the Lord. I want to ask you a question. Do you find yourself in the places at times where you are doing certain pleasures in your life, sinful pleasures, but you're not feeling even guilty about it? Where you are doing things that don't honor God, but you don't feel guilty or repercussion for it? It's really because you have set up rules in your own little kingdom, and those, aren't, those are your rules, and therefore you live by your rules, and you're not necessarily breaking God, God's rules because you are the one who is reigning there. God's, God's laws are not deemed that big of a deal. You could be finding pleasure in gossiping or overeating or binging on various things, you're not feeling like you exchanged God's glory for the glory of created things. Disobedience always finds a scapegoat. Look at verse 21 with me. Saul knows who to point at for his problems. He says, The people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Wow, so is the people. It wasn't me, Samuel, it was the people. Disobedience always finds a scapegoat. Just like Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent, nothing has changed. And sometimes we might say, well, Lord, you have made me like this, or why did you put me in a circumstance like this? Or this is just how I am. Or just, it was just everything that was around me, it wasn't me. See, we always find a scapegoat, someone to blame for our disobedience. When we're looking at these first two ideas... This is why listening to God's voice is so important. Because God has given us his word. He's telling us how we are to live based on the word. His principles, he is the king of, of, uh, of this universe and this world. And he has rules by which we ought to be living by commands. And when we listen to God's voice every day, then our little kingdom decreases and God's kingdom increases. We need to hear how God's kingdom works. We need to understand how God rules in his kingdom, what is okay and what is not okay. See, if you put yourself on the throne of your heart, then you'll be hearing and listening more to yourself and abiding by your rules more than God's. If we don't listen to God's voice, which voice are we listening to? The voice of this world that tells us what is okay and not okay? The voice of mainstream Christianity? We reach the peak of the story which is found in verse 22 of this chapter. Have you ever paused in your life to, to ask the question, what gives, God the greatest, what gives God the greatest delight? Delight is a term that is more dear. It's like a father figure, delight, right? It's near to us. The idea of, of glorify connotes this idea of like you're serving a king, he gets glory. Typically, when we walk around as Christians, we say, I want to glorify God, I want to glorify God, and that is good and all is well. But here, the, the writer uses the, the word delight. He says here, has the Lord as great delight in your service as in obeying his voice? We spend and serve so much of our time and energy in various ministries, going on mission trips, teaching in Sunday school, meeting one-on-one -on -one to disciple. We sing in choirs and play musical instruments. We try to plug ourselves into the ministry and serve the church um, so that God gets glorified. But beyond that, how we pause and ask the question, is the service that we give to God as is the greatest sacrifice? Is there something that makes him more exceedingly happy as a father? What makes God more happy versus our service? Here, Samuel says that God has greater delight in obedience more than in service. I think about my, my son Ezra, and I try to think of a picture that would help us understand this. I was thinking about my son, and I thought, you know, we have a special meal on Thursday nights. 
kind of begetting our, our day off. And if we had this wonderful dinner with our family, Ezra, Ezra set the table, and he was the best china, and he ordered my favorite meal, or my favorite place, one of my favorite places, which is Gosney's, ordered takeout from there. And he turned on my favorite music, or one of my favorites, Frank Sinatra or Dean Martin. He prepared my favorite dessert, vanilla bean ice cream with lava cake. That would be a wonderful thing. He served me for one day, for one hour, but if the rest of the week he doesn't clean up his toys, take his dishes to the sink, come when I call him, do like the things that I ask him to do and obey, that one time of him serving me at that special meal seems to not be as great a thing as the daily obedience that I, that I call of him. See, likewise in our life, we can serve God in certain days and certain hours, and we are glorifying him, but God delights more in our daily walk and our daily obedience, our daily little decisions that we make to honor him. See, as a church, we're called to, to do things for one another. God wants us to obey these commands that he gives us, like one, loving one another, not judging one another, building up one another, accepting one another, admonishing one another not envying each other, showing tolerance to one another, being kind to one another, and so many more. See, God gives us all of these commands to the church and says, fulfill them, obey them. Sometimes we find our head just stuck into, in the sand, so busy serving that we lack the time to even obey the Lord and what he desires from us. These are clear commands given to the church and they're written for us. Saul's sin is serious here. Look how it's described in verse 23. Rebellion is the sin of divination. What is rebellion? Just willful, disobe willful disobedience. So when Catalonia stands in front of me and throws a tantrum and says, no, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do that. That's what rebellion is. And he says, divination is seeking God's will. Divination is seeking to know God's will, not through God, through God, but through something else, like through a witch. And so one thing that we might be doing this idea of this rebellion, divination, says, I think that I'll consult another source of wisdom. That's what divination looks like. Presumption is being arrogant or insubordinate. And when God says presumption is like idolatry. Why is insubordination or arrogance like idolatry? Because when you're arrogant or insubordinate, you're saying that you're the one who is ruling your own life and God is not. And therefore, it is idolatry because then you, become, then you begin to serve self, your kingdom, your rules, your lifestyle. Idolatry is substituting God from his place and putting something else there. You've made yourself king. This is, again, what happened in the Garden of Eden. God is holding something back from us. And so they disobey God and think that when they disobey him, that they know better than God, and therefore they disobey. Sometimes it might look like that. At the heart of disobedience is a misplacement of rulership. Then disobedience flows in a misplacement of desire. And lastly, disobedience is a misplacement of fear. Saul had a case of peer pressure. His, his notes that he's been passing around in his high school class are now read publicly by everyone. Here's what it says here. Finally, the truth comes out of, of Saul after he's been trying to cover up his disobedience. He said, the commandments of the, of the words I've sinned, why? Because I feared the people obeyed their voice. I obeyed their voice. Disobedience fears the displeasure of people more than the displeasure of God. What will people think? What will people say about you? Saul feared the human consequences more than the divine consequences of sin. It's a, fear of man is a huge thing that we might be struggling with. Think about when God calls us to restore a relationship or someone who sinned against you, Matthew 18, for example. And we don't want to confront the person who might have sinned against us or talk with them because we think it's going to ruin a relation. We fear what the person is going to think about us. What about when we're called to restore someone who has fallen into sin in Galatians 6.2? We might come to that person and we might fear or we might not even go to them because we fear of what they're going to think about us because we might be thinking they're going to say, well, get the log out of your own eye. Stop looking at the speck that is in my eye. See, among the world, we can fall into different peer pressures. Don't want to look like oddballs. Among the church, we think more about sometimes what people think about us than what God thinks about us. And therefore, it causes disobedience. This is what Saul was thinking. There's just this army around him. They wanted to take of the spoil, and they did, because Saul feared the people more than he feared God and what God said. Now, 
the self-image and self-esteem is, is something that we think about in this world that we live in. What is the difference? Self-esteem is what you think about yourself. Self-image is what you think other people think about you. So in self-esteem, we can have good self-esteem. We don't need to grow in our self-esteem. Why? Because God thinks well of us, doesn't he? He calls us beloved son or daughters, saints, redeemed by his blood, representatives of his kingdom, vessels that he uses, home of the Holy Spirit. And so when it comes to self-image, you don't need to be thinking about what people think about you because God thinks well of you. But too often we're caught up in ourself and our self-image. What will people think about us? And therefore, it sometimes causes us to disobey the Lord. If you try to please people, you're not going to please God or please people. If you try to please God, you're going to please both. In the end, the reality is that someone has to do the dirty work. Someone has to obey when you lack disobedience. What Samuel does is he actually hacks Agag to pieces. Why? Because Saul didn't do it. Somebody has to do it. Disobedience puts a greater load on somebody else. Samuel has to finish the works that Saul didn't. You see that obedience is God-ordained purpose for everything to run smoothly. It's like the oil in the engine for the car to run well. It's the yeast in the flour for the bread to rise. Obedience is the key to make sure everything works properly in the church. Because otherwise, someone's going to be bearing more burdens than other people. Somebody is going to be praying more than other people. Otherwise, there's going to be relationships that are still lacking in forgiveness and are rusty. Somebody else is going to have to carry the brunt of the work when each of us individually disobey because we are in one body. I want to bring the gospel into this equation. And I want you to look with me at verse 23. After we see verse 23 Presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. We read, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. The reality is that we used to always disobey, and we sometimes disobey now. And as believers, God continually forgives us. Not 490 times, but thousands and hundreds of thousands of times. See, for here, it was one chance for Saul, because you've rejected the word of God. I was reading and studying over it this past week, and it really struck me. Just one time, really, Lord, one time Saul disobeys you and now you reject him from being king? How many times does God still show his favor to us in the many times that we disobey? And what is an amazing reality is that when we confess our sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The song has really struck me this past year. And here are the lyrics. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Be still my soul, redeeming love out of the dust of Calvary is rising to the throne above. There is no vengeance in his cry while it is finished fills the sky. Forgiveness is the final plea. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. One chance for Saul, many chances for us in our life because of the grace of God, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, Saul failed as a king and his kingship is going to end, is going to be taken away, pointing us to one who is a greater king who will fulfill God's purposes. And more specifically, someone who's going to be obedient to God to the point of death and even death on the cross. You see, Hebrews teaches us that Jesus learned obedience from the smaller to the greater matters because the greatest act of obedience was on the, on the cross when he was hanging there, dying not for his sins but for the sins of the world willfully laying down his life. You see, we can obey, and God has enabled us to obey in our life. The gospel really does change everything. Think about it. God rules now in our heart as king, and he, has, he sits there on the throne. And so the gospel places a new king in our heart, fixing our misplacements or brokenness of rulership. The second, he, as he's ruling, our desires are to honor him and live for his kingdom. And so the gospel places new desires in our life, fixing our misplacements of, the des of our selfish desires. The gospel places a new framework in our mind, fixing our misplacement of fear. We live by different principles, not to fear the Lord, but to fear God and honor Him. And lastly, God breaks down every idol. Presumption is as idolatry, or is idolatry. And so, as the gospel fixes us. It causes and helps us to take away the idol of self and selfishness and place God there. To place God where he really belongs. To place God 
on the seat of our emotions, will, and desires. To put God back in a place where Adam and Eve took him out of that place. God is redeeming his people to live within his people for his own glory's sake, to rule them. He's redeeming us to become more like him. He is filling our greatest need, which is himself. That is what God is doing. Ultimately, disobedience is taking God out of rulership in our heart, but uh, obedience is placing God back, and that's what the gospel has done. And so as you're battling, you're battling a battle of worship. This is why we must always remember. This is why we sing. The, the issue, why, it's like you've got to ask the question, well, how did, how did God get out of my heart? How did he come off the pedestal, right, of the, the, the throne of my heart? Well, because if you're forgetting who God is and what he's done for you, if you're forgetting his benefits, his kindness toward you, of course you're going to be thinking about self and placing self there. We need to remember, we need to, we must remember his person and his work, his goodness and his greatness. We need to hear him speak to us and we need to pray back to him. We need to sing songs and we need to read his word. We need to be around saints because when you do that and you see the glory and beauty of God, that is what causes you to say, Lord, you rule my heart. I will obey you no matter what. I'll obey you whether it's easy or it's hard, whether, the, I, whether there are fear of people or whether it's complicated. I will obey you because God takes the rulership in your heart and you are then off of the throne and God is on the throne of your heart. And when you do that, that causes you then to serve him in a way that honors him. We are not putting side by side obedience and service. We are putting it together. God is more pleased. He delights more in obedience than in sacrifice. If those two come alongside together and in the gospel, we can live like that. And so thank the Lord that although we were like Saul, because of the power of the gospel, we are now changed. And he now takes our place. And all the misplacements are put away. And the right one is put in who is God. Let's ask the Lord to help us to live like this. Father, we are asking that you would lead us by your spirit this week. That we would be men and women who honor you. That we would continually put you uh, uh, place you as the king of our heart and our life, that we might obey you, Lord. May you help us to do that. We pray for your help in Christ's name. Amen.